All right, optimal tracking. Um, so a little bit like the last set of slides, my, my primary objective in going through this is to help you understand what it is that we're trying to achieve with these tracking algorithms we're going to be talking about. Um, it's a little bit weird. I said earlier at the beginning of this class on Tuesday that I was teaching the class upside down. I said I was starting with particle filters. I probably should have said I'm actually starting with optimal trackers because we're going to cover these first. They provide a nice... Um, framework for understanding how particle filters work. But, you know, in some respects, you'd be like, well, shoot, if I can have an optimal tracker, like, why would I even ever study the common or particle filters or anything else? But I, I tried to give some sort of foreshadowing of what's happening. This is the right thing to do in low dimensions, but in higher dimensions, you can't. We'll, we'll see that we, we get stuck when we try to apply these ideas in high dimensions but it's a good theoretical foundation. This class is not heavy on theory, but um, this theory isn't that hard, and, and it's important to know, uh, know this, know, know what it is we're aiming for. And particle filters kind of try to replicate this. They try to model the optimal trackers while overcoming some of the limitations. So here's the, um, just an overview of what we'll be covering in this set of slides. So um, we spent a lot of time on that simple example that was scalar, um, and now we're going to step back into the very general framework of state space modeling. So just to reiterate some of the terminology, uh, this again is what I'm calling the process model. And this is what I'm calling the measurement model. I'll use those terms consistently throughout. Again, if you read other, other books or other references, sometimes they'll call this the state model. And this is often called the observation model. So sticking with the uh, submarine example, the process model is like physics of a submarine underwater, and the measurement model is like what the radar tells you? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and... Um, this is very powerful. It can't be used. It, it can be used for a lot of things, but it's most appropriately used uh, when when you've got something you're trying to estimate that that really do, can be represented by this kind of uh, model. I've seen people try to do this where they're they're trying to estimate, for example, spatial variation of of a density where they, they get indirect measurements. But in that case, they don't really have a process model or prior knowledge that's appropriate. And, and there are other ways to approach some of those problems. So it's not perfect for everything. But certainly um, tracking applications, we're actually trying to track something that's moving, the submarine, the whale, the truck, the lane. Uh, uh, what? Rocket. Rocket, yeah, good. Um, in those cases, this, this is a very good framework. And there's, there's many others where you can use it as well. We'll talk about that, but this is very general. Uh, the thing we're trying to estimate does not have to be a scalar. Um, it's a vector. So, you know, I'm expressing, and you know, I say this is in the space, uh, in the real space, and it's m-dimensional, um, but there are formulations for all this, of course, for the complex value case as well. And even complex numbers can be generalized, and there's, there's probably a way to generalize this when you're working with kind of very uh, generalizations of complex numbers as well. But I, I haven't seen that, but that probably exists. Um, our measurements can also be multidimensional, and I'll use P uh, to denote the dimension of our measurement vector. Um, we've got a process model that can change over time. And again, you can model those the effect of the external inputs that Andy was bringing up um, is basically having a time, the time varying component of that function. And similarly with our measurement model, it can be time varying. It doesn't have to be uh, the same over time. And in fact, every time sample, it's possible that our noise distributions are changing from one time sample to the next, that they're changing completely. Um, and these functions, uh, the process model and the measurement model, can be nonlinear. There can be a very nonlinear relationship between the measurements that we take and the state that we're trying to estimate, or between the state of time n plus 1 and what it was at time n. So there's a lot of flexibility in this framework. It's nonlinear, it's time-varying, it's stochastic. 
it's very general in that respect. So in this case, we... There you are, you move. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's like, oh, you left. So in this case, we've said that um, our X vector is in the reals, which means that there's no way to incorporate constraints on its values. So there's no way that I can say, like, for example, my speed of my truck is strictly positive. No, you, you can certainly... Uh, you can incorporate that. Um, you can incorporate that actually fairly easily in your process model. Yeah, it's not hard, but it but it shows up here now is where it goes. But yeah, you can still incorporate those constraints even though x is a vector. It's not a problem at all. And in fact, those constraints could be linear constraints. So you could say, you know, it's even more general. When you said that the process model is time varying, is that equivalent to thinking of the like state space as being non-ergodic or something like that, where it's like it's not full a full mesh, I guess. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, you're asking about some of the ideas we talked about last spring. Um, well, no, I mean, not exactly, because you know, I, I guess like with the state space model, they, they use the same ergodic terminology, right, uh, of, of the idea being that you can go from any state to any other state. Um, the the I, you may be using ergodic in a way that I don't quite understand. The way oh, way sorry. we talked about it last spring was when you've got a stationary process, does the time average in the limit converge to the ensemble mean? Yeah. But in this case, as soon as you have something that is um, is time varying, it's non stationary. That yeah. that no longer makes sense because the time average you're taking a time average now of something that's changing over time. So I, I'm sorry, I just don't quite understand so like what you're trying to get at. That's okay. Yeah, so okay. I, maybe I'm asking it in a sort of backwards way, but I guess what I'm asking is I'm trying to envision the process model as a state space, like um, sort of thinking about what a time varying state space would look like. Is that, uh, and, and I guess what I'm trying to ask is like, if it's a time varying state space, are you saying that it's like a left to right state space or something like that where once you start progressing through it you can't go back to previous states or are you saying simply no. maybe like okay. the, the A matrix yeah. changes <coughs> change over time so okay. just so having the, the actual a weights yeah. the actual transition probably. so like some of them outside your control happens every five seconds okay. so the dynamics of your process change okay. yeah that so would your work your submarine loses fuel and now it's inertia has changed sure. although that should be a state <laughs> not if, if, if you can say that I strictly know that it's not a random variable, that my yeah. fuel in my vehicle is not a random variable, then you can treat it as an element in your process model, not as a state of your process model. If you know what it is. I guess it depends on whether it's your submarine or an enemy submarine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are good points. So would you, would you generally have there that uh, in the limit, P would be equal to M? Would, would you generally have... No. Or is, would, does P have to be greater than M? Or? Nope, nope, and that's one of the beautiful things about the basing framework. Um, there's no constraints on P and M. Usually they're not the same. It's rare for them to be the same. Um, so, no, they're, they're of different dimensions, um, usually completely, and you, you can have both cases. Um, you'd say, well, wait a minute. How can I have fewer measurements than the dimension of the state that I'm trying to estimate? Doesn't that mean that it's underdetermined and that there would be a multitude of solutions uh, that would solve it perfectly? And the answer is no, uh, because we've got the prior. The, um, the prior is the thing that keeps it well conditioned, is having that prior knowledge. So it, it works out that there's no constraints on, on M and P or the relationship between the two. It's really cool. Yeah. It's the, nice. The PDF can still have multiple modes, though, which would happen if it was like underdetermined. That's one, that's one place where it would be. Well, um, yeah, yeah, I'll show you another example of it, but it turns out that it's n never going to be underdetermined because we've got the process model, because we've got that prior. That's what <coughs> prevents it from being underdetermined. It doesn't relate to how many modes there are. The, the letters P and M don't, don't affect the modes. If you've got a linear state space model, you always have a single mode, it turns out. So you might have a measurement which is in terms of like the, the radar cross-section of the submarine that you're trying to track and it's ambient noise level only but then you have a bunch of process model internal process model functions which tell you that based on that like turbine speed and uh, um, uh, the, the alloy the hull is made out of and all of this stuff then that produces a variety of different state estimates that could be many more than 
because the process model is complex, it could be many more than the number of actual measurements that he took. As, uh, as engineers, you'll find that it's often in your interest to keep the process model as simple as you can. And so it's pretty rare to account for all the possible factors you might know of. And one of the problems you run into is uh, if I had, just, just to give an example of why that's usually a good principle, I guess I could have erased that. Um, if y of n is, let's say, equal to um, xn of 1 plus xn of 2 plus maybe some measurement noise, and let's say x1 of n uh, is a random walk plus 1, excuse me, x1 of n plus some noise, and same thing for x2. I did this wrong, didn't I? I'm swapping. I'm sorry, I got my uh, time index confused with the index of the vector. I, I, it, these ends should be subscripts, and the ones should be in the parentheses. But in any case, the, the point that I was trying to make uh, in, in this made-up example is that in this process, you're going to have a heck of a time distinguishing between uh, x in 1 and x in 2, because y of n depends on them equally, and your prior information about them is identical, so there's really no way to distinguish between them. The whole framework will still generate estimates of x n of 1 and x n of 2, but it will probably have very wide confidence intervals because you can't distinguish between them. So if the dynamics of your submarine depends on turbine speed and the, uh, the density of the alloy that it's made out of, both of those may affect the dynamics in a similar way. And then you end up with this um, ill-conditioning problem where you're taking measurements, but it relates to, to states that can kind of cancel each other out and that, uh, that makes it hard to estimate the state and you end up with really wide confidence intervals. So usually we're trying to design these process models to be as simple as we can. We kind of have a problem right now at work where you want to know like, how fast the truck can go up a hill and you don't know like how much horsepower it has or how heavy it is, but both of them, both of those things affect how quickly or slowly the truck will go up the hill because it has more horsepower for the same load. It would go faster. Aren't you building the truck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then the customer puts all kinds of things in the back. <laughs> but those That's, don't affect the horsepower, do they? Well, well but, they also put a lot of stuff <clears> on the front, <throat> too. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the driver? Well, but, but what, if, what if we're trying to estimate that on a, some other vehicle that's in front of us? Based only on the range and their Oh, I see. It's, like so it's not, not this truck in front of it, the truck that you're in. Got it, you got it. You want to estimate things about the vehicles around you. So you're trying to follow the truck in front of you, and you're like, I don't know, it's yeah. dynamics. Right. Well, one of the things you can do is um, include those as part of your state vector and try to estimate them. Right. But you got to be careful. Yeah, for for the reasons that I I, I was it's raising. It's probably a better example of two parameters that can affect the same thing. Yeah, way. that's a really good point. Thank you for that. I guess I guess the confusing part is that if you're coming from a common record pulse perspective, or already you're jumping to linear, you say, oh, if it's underdetermined, I can't find anything. But that doesn't mean you still can't find anything. It just means that it could be anything. Yeah, that's right. And in a common filter framework, you can certainly find it, but you'll have huge confidence intervals if you've got multiple things that can cancel each other out in that way. Yeah. Um, we're pretty close to 6.30. This is probably a good stopping point. So we'll pick up this topic next Tuesday. You have enough information now to actually do the homework assignment. It's not due till Thursday, but um, just so you know, you can start early. I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Have a great weekend.